the the outline um, of the lecture today is to finish off uh, the last couple of slides from yesterday uh, that I went over rather uh, quickly, uh, which had to do with the applications of the Alpha Swarjama. Then I'll talk about uh, a new class of operators, which is of course no longer very new. Uh, these uh, this class of operators were introduced by Cowan and Douglas in the early 70s, which means that they're about 50 years old. Uh, I mean, they have a history of 50 years. Uh, so much so that as I have been uh, saying uh, almost everywhere, when I talk about these operators now, that um, very happily for all of us who work uh, in this area, the uh, math reviews has now introduced a new classification called the Cowan Douglas class. Uh, well, so we will um, we'll discuss um, these operators uh, in some way, and I encourage all of you to think about and uh, consider the possibility of studying these this class of operators uh, in depth whenever you get a chance. The most surprising thing uh, of the lecture today would be the relationship between the uh, Gram-Smith orthogonalization process, which I'm pretty sure uh, you would have seen by now, and the curvature, the curvature in the sense of the Gaussian curvature that we have already introduced, or there are actually many different notions of curvature. Uh, we'll uh, discuss that a little bit, but the main point is to, to say that the curvature really is no more, no less than what you might call the Gram-Smith process. Uh, in fact, for all of you to sort of take home, I'll tell you the following story. Um, 30 odd years ago when uh, I first started doing my PhD um, and, and uh, I chose to work with uh, Professor Douglas, who unfortunately is no more. Uh, he passed away just a couple of years ago and uh, I kind of miss uh, his company uh, all the time. Anyway, we were, um, when, when I was uh, beginning uh, uh, as a graduate student, uh, he asked me to uh, study uh, this very newly introduced uh, class of operators. It was very new then. Uh, I'm talking about um, 79 or 80. This class of operators were introduced in uh, maybe 75 or 76. So it was very fresh. Um, I had no understanding of either complex geometry or for that matter, uh, any any uh, real uh, understanding of operator theory. Um, so I, I would go uh, very nervously to him and tell him that, look, uh, this sort of very uh, sophisticated mathematics I won't be able to cope with. And I very clearly remember on one occasion, he is, he is telling me, um, but what is, what is there to all this? It is really no more than gram -Smith. And um, for the last 30 odd years, I have been trying to sort of really understand the significance of that statement. Namely that finally, there is nothing more than just the Gram-Smith process. And uh, if I can sort of explain uh, what that really means, I'll be, I'll be very happy. Um, and of course, in the end, uh, we'll sort of uh, discuss uh, what the curvature inequalities are and what they are good for and how they are related to operator theory. So let us to begin with, discuss a little bit from yesterday. Uh, yesterday's uh, last couple of slides. Uh, slides. Um, a metric P uh, is uh, uh, defined to be, um, to be just a positive uh, C2 function as Deepak 
explained yesterday during the tutorial session, I need uh, need the uh, function to be C2, twice continuously differentiable. For the kind of computations I am doing, as you can imagine, uh, with more sophisticated technology, you can perhaps uh, dispense with that. In fact, in this area, uh, this subject is so well developed that people actually work with a metric which is actually continuous. And then you have to bring in other kinds of technical tools. That's not my goal here. And you'll notice the P square. The metric is actually P square. Um, and it is the P square that, um, that you uh, sort of differentiate and, uh, you know, work with. Uh, so it is, it, is, uh, it is like the difference between looking at a norm versus the norm square. The norm square is actually the inner product. That is what one talks about when you are talking about the Riemannian metric. Now, for simplicity and uh, not to get into way too much of language and terminology, we will take the Gaussian curvature to be simply the expression Pz minus two delta log Pz, where this delta uh, delta is actually uh, this this delta here is really um, dz dz bar uh, d square dz dz bar as was explained yesterday it is very convenient to have this understanding mm -hmm. that when you have d square dx square plus d square dy square in real coordinates that's actually the same as uh, that is actually the same as d square dz dz bar, okay? And uh, this makes all kinds of computations very easy. For example, if you have f is a holomorphic function and you are computing fz absolute square, then it is fz times fz bar. And you immediately see that um, uh, this function, if you differentiate with respect to dz bar, uh, you get f prime uh, fz bar, and um, and then if you differentiate with respect to uh, z, you'll get f prime z. But once you get f prime z, which is a holomorphic function uh, in in um, uh, in the z variable. It is straightforward to differentiate that. You apply chain rule, uh, sorry, not chain rule, the product rule, and you differentiate this with respect to first uh, dz and then, then dz bar. But when you differentiate a second prime with respect to dz bar, it becomes zero. So fz absolute square as an exercise, you can uh, convince yourself what happens when you take or you can ask yourself, what happens if you differentiate using this real coordinate Laplacian as opposed to using um, using the complex coordinates? Okay, uh, that's a neat exercise to to sort of uh, convince yourself that this way of looking at the Laplacian, particularly when you are dealing with functions which are real analytic, is very useful. Real analytic, of course, means that the function that you have is a function of z and z bar. It's a power series in z and z bar. So differentiating with respect to uh, this operator makes it very easy. Okay. Um, so all of that was discussed yesterday. And um, all I'm saying now is that this is the definition of our Gaussian curvature. I could have very easily written in place of delta, dz, dz bar, maybe with a four or one over four or something like that. Now, a very important thing is uh, to recognize uh, what was called uh, the pullback. So a metric is just any uh, positive uh, C2 function. And if you have a holomorphic map, from omega to omega tilde, f is holomorphic, and you have a 
metric on omega tilde here you have a p then f upper star of phi evaluated at z now this z is in omega so you you get this to be f prime z absolute value times p composite fz now remember f is taking omega to omega tilde so this is a point in omega tilde p gets evaluated on that f prime z um, absolute value so this becomes this f upper star p becomes a uh, metric for the domain omega if you particularly look at f prime z absolute square p f z whole square that is that is what is the metric um, in particular if you look at look at the unit disk if you look at the unit disk in the swarj lemma we saw that there was a very very crucial object called the poincare metric 1 over 1 minus absolute z square but if you take the disk not with radius 1 please believe me for now if disk if you take a disk of radius r then the metric is actually uh, sorry r divided by 1 r square minus absolute z square so this is a uh, this is a metric on a disk of radius r and what we are saying is if you have any any function that is defined from omega to the this disk of radius r and if you call this metric rho r or something you can pull back this f star of rho r and this will be a metric on omega and what is more this is a straight forward computation that the gaussian curvature as defined here is going to be bounded above by a negative constant in fact it will turn out that it will be exactly the same constant as this one and that depends on all this calculus that i told you about that the laplacian is nothing but d square dz dz bar okay so uh, so that is a claim and it plays a crucial role so f upper star is this quantity it turns out this and then then if you look at my notes that i have put on the uh, uh, you know uh, drop uh, in the drop box you will find that uh, uh, this quantity you can compute its gaussian curvature and it will turn out to be exactly minus 4 or minus 4 depending on how you are doing it and what is beautiful about the alpha lemma is that it says whenever you have a, so this is the first time there is a connection between a connection between what you might call a uh, complex geometry uh, geometry and analysis is established by by alpers and this is considered to be one of his very very uh, uh, significant contributions among many other things that he has done but this very simple looking lemma i am not going to repeat the proof of the lemma the lemma uh, the proof entirely depends on two facts if you can remember those two facts that a continuous function on a compact set attains its maximum and at a point of maximum the laplacian of the function must be negative okay so these two essentially make up the proof of the alpha lemma why is this alpha lemma beautiful because if you remember what we had proved uh, from the ordinary swarj lemma we had proved that if f is a holomorphic map from the disk into itself and uh, f of alpha is actually equal to beta then derivative of f at alpha in absolute square divided by 1 minus absolute beta square is lesser equal to 1 over 1 minus absolute alpha square 
but of course you can change this beta since take beta take alpha to be an arbitrary z so this is really f of z beta is f of z and alpha is z if you write it that way then you will see that this inequality is simply saying this is 1 minus f of z absolute square and this is f of z and this is 1 minus absolute square but this is for this particular metric on the disk which is 1 minus absolute z square in the metric what is the alpha lemma doing well the alpha lemma is saying that if you look at f prime z absolute divided by divided f prime z absolute e f of z okay then that is less or equal to 1 over this eta you can forget i am going to take eta to be equal to 1 or 4 so this is just 1 okay so it is saying f prime z absolute eta z is less or equal to 1 over 1 minus absolute z square with a force so this eta you forget i am going to take it to be just uh, four so so this is not necessary uh, for some this is not necessary then f prime z absolute value phi of f z is less or equal to four times one minus absolute z square okay so this is saying in the in the earlier case if you take phi to be just 1 over 1 minus absolute z square if p was the usual poincare metric then you will get f prime z absolute divided by 1 minus f z absolute square which is a particular case but what the alpha lemma is saying that if the function p satisfies this curvature condition then even though it is practical practically an arbitrary function subject to this little curvature condition you get this inequality for for almost any function p prime f prime z is bounded above by p of f z divided by 1 minus absolute z square where all you demand of the p is that it must satisfy the curvature condition now something as beautiful as this as you may expect has uh, lots and lots of applications in many areas of mathematics to to show you i am not going to go into a lot of different applications but but let me just give you a understanding of what this is good for so for any open connected set let nc omega denote the set of all continuous functions on omega such that this p is c2 on wherever p is strictly positive as i told you uh, there is a problem there is going to be a problem if i don't take p to be strictly positive although uh, p being zero can be allowed and there are ways in which you can tackle this but it is not necessary for our purposes we take p to be continuous everywhere but because remember that i told you there are two uh, things that go into the proof of the alpha lemma one of them is that this metric must be continuous i mean you are applying um, the lemma that a continuous function on a compact set must attain its maximum and that is why you need p to be continuous and then uh, then you are looking at all those functions p which satisfy the curvature condition okay once you do that then um, using the chain rule you can easily verify that um, that if f is a map which is holomorphic from omega to omega tilde then 
uh, where omega and omega tilde are open connected sets, then the pullback, if omega tilde has a metric of negative curvature, then the pullback under, under F must also be a metric of negative curvature. This is what you learn from, uh, from a direct computation, okay? So this is, this, is, uh, this is just saying that if you had here, P already has, is a metric of negative curvature on omega tilde, but the pullback then is a metric of negative curvature on omega. This is what you do. Now we apply the alpha lemma. We apply the alpha lemma to say that NC omega must be equal to zero. NC, uh, sorry, by omega, I mean the, the, there is no metric of negative curvature. There is no metric whose curvature is bounded above by a negative constant on the entire complex plane. And this follows easily from the alpha lemma. That's the first thing I want you to notice. Because if there was such a P, P, pick such a P. Suppose P is a metric of negative constant curvature, okay, or curvature bounded above by a negative constant. Then take any point in C and take R to be bigger than absolute value of A. Consider the disk of radius R and a holomorphic function from R to R, uh, the disk of radius R to itself. This holomorphic function you can take in particular to be just the identity function. Apply the alpha lemma to this situation with the Poincare metric for the disk of radius r. What is the Poincare metric for the disk of radius r? Well, it is just this. So the alpha lemma says the pullback of the Poincare metric. What would be the pullback of the Poincare metric? Well, it's going to be P of A because the derivative, this pullback would have been derivative of F evaluated at a absolute value P of F of A, okay? But F of A is A, so it is P of A and P prime of A because F is Z is just one. So this pullback is nothing but the pullback is nothing but this quantity. But by alpha lemma, this should be lesser equal to r over r square minus absolute a square. But r is arbitrary, but more than r is any arbitrary positive number more than absolute value of a. Let r go to infinity, but then when r goes to infinity, this quantity becomes zero. And because this is zero, p of a is zero. But A itself was arbitrary. And consequently, we see that uh, there can be no, uh, no metric of negative curvature on, uh, on the entire comp complex plane. Now, as a result, it follows that if F is any map from the complex plane to omega, where omega is a bounded domain, then F must be a constant. Well, this is immediate because if omega is a bounded region, then the pullback of, of this, this metric, the pullback of the metric on omega under such a holomorphic function will produce a metric whose curvature is bounded above by a negative constant. If there was a negative, you know, metric of, uh, metric whose curvature was bounded above uh, by a negative constant, then uh, which is the meaning of this? I am assuming that omega is such that it has a metric whose curvature is bounded above by a negative constant. In other words, this is non-zero. But if that was the case, the pullback under F, as we have said, will produce a metric of negative curvature on C. But we have just now seen that that is not possible giving a contradiction. So if you 
I have a holomorphic function to repeat from C to a domain omega. For simplicity, you may take the domain to be a bounded domain. Um, but the condition on the domain omega is that it has a metric whose curvature is bounded above by a negative constant. If that is the case, then the function f itself must be constant because otherwise you can pull back the metric of negative constant curvature from here under f to c, you will pull back. But once you pull it back to c, then you find that um, c itself will have a metric whose curvature is bounded above by a negative constant and that leads to a contradiction. So finally, let us quickly give uh, application. As a corollary, taking omega, take omega to be the disk of radius m, then we see that every bounded entire function must be constant. Because if you have a bounded entire function, that means you can take omega, f is a map, which is holomorphic from all of C to a disk of radius at most n. Because the function is bounded, its range is lying inside some disk of radius m. But a disk of radius m has what is called the Poincare metric, whose curvature is exactly minus 4. And therefore, you can pull it back under this hypothetical entire function. And the pullback metric will be a metric on the entire complex plane whose curvature is going to be again minus four. Now that's a contradiction and therefore you have to prove the level theorem. Now you might say that's too much to uh, work to prove just the level theorem. But as I have been telling you, there are many, many applications of this idea of Alfred's lemma. Picard's little theorem, as well as Picard's big theorem, Sutkis theorem, um, Bloch's theorem, several other theorems in complex analysis, which were proved earlier on directly by, by elaborate computations, can be seen to be consequences of the alpha slab. So Picard's theorem, just to give you a sample, let us take Picard's little theorem. If f is a map from the complex plane to the complex plane minus just two points. So suppose you have a holomorphic function on the entire complex plane, but rather than being bounded, which is the case with the Liouville's theorem, rather than being bounded, you say that it misses only two values. Namely, it, its range lies in C minus two points. Then the function f must be constant. Now that's not difficult to prove again. To verify this, all you need to do is to show that this object, which is my domain omega now, admits a metric such that its curvature is bounded above by a negative constant. That's all that you have to do. Now you can take the non-zero function, Tz, absolute z, beta over 2 minus 1, 1 minus z, beta over 2 minus 1, 1 plus whatever this expression that I have written down here. Uh, there are many such. This is not the only possibility, this expression. And it will turn out that if beta is chosen to be between 0 and 2 over 7, then this metric, if you compute the curvature, particularly using d square dz dz bar, which is not, not a very difficult computation, then you will be able to establish that, uh, that the curvature, uh, when beta is between, between this range, in this range, then you will have uh, a a metric whose curvature is bounded above by a negative constant. Okay. Now that finishes um, the, the leftover from yesterday. Uh, let me come back to um, 
to to uh, to the Cowan Douglas class of operators, which I talked about. Um, so, as is uh, my usual style, let me try to say that the meaning of the Cowan Douglas operator is okay. Let let's just go over the definition a little bit, and then I'll try to tell you. So. Um, I want to talk about a class of operators. This is actually very, very close to what you might consider to be linear algebra. I'll explain in a minute what I mean by close to linear algebra. Okay, so we talk about a class of operators for which every point omega in the disk is an eigenvalue. Now, you can actually talk about any open domain omega in C or even CF for this purpose. Not necessarily just the disk, but I am talking about the disk for the for simplicity. So first of all, try to think of an operator for which each omega in the disk is an eigenvalue. Then you imagine that the eigenvector omega going to omega, gamma omega, is holomorphic. In other words, this is a rather subtle point. Actually, I should have said the dimension of the eigenspace is one. First, you say that the dimension of the eigenspace is one. Again, in general, this dimension can be taken to be n, not necessarily possibly greater than one. But I am taking I am taking it to be one for simplicity. So this should go first of all here. Okay, so the dimension of the eigenspace is one. We have eigenvalues and we know that the eigenspace is one. Well, if I look at the point omega, which is an eigenvalue, sitting on top of this is the eigenspace. This is a one dimensional space. So anything I choose here is an eigenvector. I have a neighboring point omega prime, and I similarly have an eigenspace on top of this. Anything I choose here is also an eigenvector. Now it's entirely up to me how I choose the eigenvector here and here. The demand is the class of operators are chosen in such a way, and there are, I'll, I'll give you examples just in a minute, there are ways and means by which you can ensure there are plenty of operators where you can choose your eigenvector. This is very, very important to understand that you can choose your eigenvector in such a way that the map omega going to gamma omega is holomorphic. Now, this gamma omega, which is the eigenvector, is not God given. Gamma omega is determined only up to a constant multiple, okay? But nevertheless, the assertion is that there is a choice of this eigenvector so that omega going to gamma omega is holomorphic. We'll have more to say about what holomorphic means, but for those of you who are curious, I would say that the map omega going to gamma omega is holomorphic. Now remember, this is in some Hilbert space. I would say this map is holomorphic provided omega going to gamma omega inner product with x is holomorphic. Now this is, this is a complex valued map is holomorphic for all x in the Hilbert space H. So to, to say that this this one map is holomorphic 
to say that this one map is holomorphic, I am demanding that that is the same as saying this map, this complex valued map is holomorphic for all X. Okay. The class of operators B1, D was introduced by Cowan and Douglas. They showed, among other things, that the unitary equivalence class um, of the operator T and the equivalence class of the holomorphic Hermitian bundle L determined by the holomorphic frame gamma determine each other. Now, what does that mean? So, like I had drawn that picture, um, so you have these. These are the eigenspaces. And this is why I said I'll tell you what linear algebra here has, uh, you know, what one means by linear algebra. Now, these are one dimensional spaces, okay? And suppose you have another operator, and again in the Cowan Douglas class, so that you have, now remember, although I have drawn these dots, this actually is coming from the disk. The base is actually the disk, okay? This is an open set. And on each point of the open set, I have a one-dimensional vector space. What basically Cowan and Douglas do is to show that if there is a map that maps this one-dimensional space to this one-dimensional space, by that I mean the omega here must match with the omega here this one dimensional space to this one dimensional space, that is the omega prime here must match with the omega prime here. Now, these are all one dimensional spaces. These one dimensional spaces, you can call them C omega. And you have another C omega. This is corresponding to the operator T. This is corresponding to the operator T prime. Now this one dimensional space, is sitting inside your Hilbert space H. This one dimensional spaces are sitting inside H prime, which means C omega also has an inner product borrowed from the Hilbert space in which it is sitting. This C omega also has an inner product borrowed from the Hilbert space H prime in which it is sitting. Now, what you are saying is that if there is a map, let us say theta, which of course depends on omega, this is what I was talking about yesterday. These are two one-dimensional spaces. What can be a map between those two one-dimensional spaces? Well, it can only be a multiplication by a complex number. So this theta omega is nothing but, if you like, this theta omega, you give me a Z in C omega in the first copy, it just takes it to some P omega. This has to depend times Z. Otherwise, I would have just written something. But as omega varies, this P omega is just a complex number. This is a one dimensional space. So Z goes to again the same Z, but multiplied by a complex number. But as omega varies, you get a map going to P omega. And what you demand is that this omega going to P omega as a complex valued map is holomorphic. And not only that, it's actually a, a preserves inner products, preserves the inner product that you had in this copy and the inner product in this copy. So that is linear algebra in, in its uh, truest spirit, if you like. And that is what the Cowan Douglas theory is all about. Although this, uh, you know, the, uh, putting these dots and making these lines in the complex geometry language, this is called a line bundle or a vector bundle or something. And uh, the map that I wrote down just now, theta omega, is called, is a bundle map. It's called a bundle map, but it's nothing but a map that takes eigenspaces to eigenspaces, okay? So that is our Cowan-Douglas class. And uh, 
what is well known and this is the part i will not go over right here and this is where the curvature comes in you remember i told you that there is this at each c omega we have this which means that if i look at gamma omega then it has a norm okay and like yesterday and like we discussed just now there is a quantity called the curvature namely d square d omega d omega bar this existence of theta omega taking your eigen spaces to eigen spaces preserving the inner product theta omega is an isometric bundle map this is quite well known in the language of complex geometry is an isometric bundle map if and only if you look at this this is equal to the corresponding thing for the other operator okay this is called the curvature of the operator t and this is the curvature of the other operator t tilde i tilde so essentially the count douglas theorem says that two operators are unitarily equivalent two operators on a infinite dimensional hilbert space are unitarily equivalent if and only if you can make a linear algebra problem out of it. namely if and only if the restriction of those operators to their eigen spaces are intertwined by a holomorphic map preserving the inner product that again as i must say i repeat is uh, linear algebra in in uh, true glory if you like okay uh now typically when i uh, when i am teaching a class or something i i talk about given a class of operators t there are two things that you want to do you want to determine when t is unitarily equivalent or perhaps similar or something to another operator t tilde to do this you need two things you need an invariant to detect uh the equivalence i'll explain what i mean by this and you need a model now let us for a minute talk about normal operators normal finite dimensional transformations what do i mean well if you have two normal operators n1 and n2 the invariants you know the invariants are what the invariants are eigen values counted according to multiplicity counting multiplicity well but what is the model the model for a normal operator is the diagonal form you know that um, every normal operator can be written as a diagonal operator and once you write it as a diagonal operator the invariants the the eigen values are actually sitting on the diagonal and you can uh, see them uh, so to say so all of operator theory is based on these two ideas that given operate given a class of operators find a model and if you are lucky enough in finding the model in such a way that is from within the unitary equivalence class of the operator t you find something that looks nice that looks nice if it really looks so nice that whenever you look at two of these model operators you are able to decide when they are unitarily equivalent or not you are you are lucky you are in good set 
but sometimes it may happen that even if you find a good model you still may need uh, an invariant to decide whether the two operators are unitarily equivalent or not that is what happens in this case i have already told you that for the cowan douglas class of operators the curvature is actually a model uh, sorry the curvature is actually an invariant but there is another thing cowan and douglas themselves um actually uh, find uh, a, what is called a model what is the model if you are given an operator t in the uh, in this class then it is actually unitarily equivalent to an operator which is the adjoint of the multiplication operator adjoint of some multiplication operator by the coordinate function on a hilbert space h of holomorphic functions on omega star remember omega is the set of eigen values okay possessing a reproducing kernel k so all these terms one need to explain a little bit so omega star of course is this domain and uh, in the uh, afternoon session today uh, during the tutorial we will discuss some of these ideas a little bit more and in some some detail but let us first say that a kernel function is nothing but a map from omega star cross omega star to c holomorphic in the first variable and anti holomorphic in the second variable the map omega going to k dot omega bar omega in omega is holomorphic okay so as a result um, you know this this map as i said it's important to know that this map is holomorphic uh, the function k is also required to satisfy what is called the hermitian property which means k z comma w is actually equal to k uh, k z comma w is actually equal to k w comma z bar and positive definite the crucial part is that it must be positive definite that is if you write down a matrix like this k is a function remember in two variables you take an arbitrary set of points w1 w2 wn and you write k w i comma w j i j going from 1 to n so you get a n by n matrix with entries that are from the domain omega star now you allow n to be arbitrary the size can be anything and the number of points i mean the points in omega star of size n that is all subsets of size n you consider this uh, n by n matrix and require that that be positive definite when you do that uh, it actually defines an inner product there is a way which i am not going to go into it's possible that in the afternoon um, session we will discuss this given given such a k given such a k on omega star comma omega comma omega star there is a there exists a hilbert space h for which k serves as the reproducing kernel in other words you can construct a hilbert space starting from this k you have to actually look at finite linear combinations actually the hilbert space is obtained by looking at ai k dot wi a1 through an belonging to the complex numbers i equal to 1 to n and n in this call this h sub 0 and now you can put a natural inner product on this 
by saying that the inner product of two such vectors is just summation a i a j bar k w j comma w i this will not be a complete inner product space this will be a inner product space because of the non negative definiteness that we have assumed here but then you complete it to get a uh, get a hilbert space that's what i mean by saying that there is a hilbert space uh, corresponding to such a non negative definite form what is more in that hilbert space if you pick an arbitrary function f you will have this reproducing property f of w can be obtained by taking inner product of f with k dot w okay now what is i mean there are a couple of other things that one needs to say about this the reproducing property of k all of this is um, not very hard to hard to see in fact there is a very very readable paper by wallen and seeds i don't know where it appeared but if you look under wallen and seeds all of this would have been discussed um and as i said some of it we will ourselves do perhaps in the uh, afternoon session in the tutorial so the reproducing property of k ensures that m star of k dot w is actually w bar k dot w now this is the beautiful thing here that you have to notice that once you have such a non negative definite kernel m star on k dot w becomes w bar k dot w where the w is actually from omega star or rather now omega star is a domain which means that such operators that is adjoints of the multiplication operator on a reproducing kernel hilbert space possess what one might call a open set of eigen values so this this class that kavan and douglas started studying is not a small class there are plenty of these operators that belong to the class so the same thing i have written therefore for omega in omega gamma omega bar we can take to be k dot w bar because remember that um, if omega is in omega gamma omega bar is in omega bar is in omega star and once it is in omega star this is actually holomorphic in omega okay so this defines a natural holomorphic frame for the operator m star in other words i had to find something that is the choice of the eigen vector which had to be holomorphic here we have a natural candidate k dot omega bar is a natural choice of an eigen vector so that the map omega going to k dot omega bar where omega is from capital omega is actually uh, is actually a holomorphic pair so so far so good we have all this so we we set therefore in this definition of the kavan douglas class we simply take gamma omega to be this okay uh for any operator t uh in the class b1 of omega remember b1 of omega was defined kind of abstractly um saying that we must be able to find a holomorphic choice um but now we are going to work with only this class of operators which are adjoints of multiplication operators but before we exploit that let us get rid of something in full generality without going into the model namely that if you have an operator t in the b1 omega class then you are saying that t minus omega i gamma omega is equal to 0 this is just the uh, condition that gamma omega is an eigen vector with eigen value omega okay now such a thing 
we can differentiate with respect to omega. P is a linear map. It is, uh, you know, uh, being a linear map, uh, we, can, we can actually differentiate using, um, by taking the derivative inside. So T of gamma omega, the derivative of a linear map is itself. That is again some little bit of linear algebra that you should convince yourself of. So T of gamma omega, when differentiated, gives me uh, gamma T of gamma prime omega. And then that is equal to derivative of omega times gamma omega, but that is fixed. Okay. So now, now slowly we are going to do more and more of linear algebra. So I have this operator on an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, but it satisfies this condition. T gamma prime omega equal to gamma omega plus omega gamma prime omega. What I'm going to do is to look at T minus omega i and yeah, if I, here I want to write something. I want to write this as T minus omega i times gamma prime omega is equal to gamma omega. This is the same as writing this. So what I'm going to do is to look at T minus omega i and restrict it to the two dimensional subspace gamma omega gamma prime omega. If I restrict T minus omega i to a two dimensional subspace. Remember, uh, in the beginning, we started with just these, the eigenspaces. But I am going to enlarge these eigenspaces a little bit. I now add not only the eigenspace, but these are two dimensional spaces with gamma prime omega added to gamma omega. Okay. And I look at the operator T minus omega i restricted to this two, two dimensional space and call it NT omega. This is my operator NT omega. Now we assign a natural meaning to HT omega to HT and KT omega. Now where is HT and KT omega? Just one second. Uh, it's sort of missing. Yeah, it's kind of later. Um, okay. Here it is missing. So let me uh, let me sort of say. Let me explain something here. If I look at n sub t omega, this is a two-dimensional operator, right? So it has a matrix representation like this. What is it doing? It is looking at, if I apply NT omega to gamma omega, this is going to go to zero. If I apply NT omega to gamma prime omega, then it's going to go to gamma omega. I'll have more to say about this. So I have two vectors, gamma prime omega and gamma omega. And I have a linear map. The linear map is taking this to zero and taking this gamma prime omega to gamma omega. Now, since this is a course on linear algebra, I must ask you, what is the matrix representation of such an operator? What is the meaning of such an operator? Well, there are only two vectors. The first vector goes to zero and the second vector comes back to the first vector, okay? If I apply the operator again, after all this, after, after these operations, what has happened? What is in the image? What is in the image? So after I apply NT omega to these two vectors, gamma omega and gamma prime omega, 
the image consists of only gamma omega right because nt omega takes gamma omega to zero takes gamma prime omega to gamma omega so if i apply nt omega a second time all i will get is zero and that is what is called a nilpotent operator so if you like a matrix representation for this guy is just 0 0 and 1 with respect to the basis and this is where the statement from professor douglas that i talked about comes in this is with respect to the basis gamma omega gamma prime omega now notice that these are there is no reason why gamma omega and gamma prime omega form a orthonormal basis there need not be an orthonormal basis apply gram smith and make an orthonormal basis transform this to an orthonormal basis then what will happen well those of you who have familiarity with this and can imagine what the gram smith process is doing well it will multiply this gamma omega only by a constant namely divide by its own norm but gamma prime omega will become a linear combination of gamma omega and gamma prime omega which will mean that this guy oh uh np of omega yeah uh this will go to 0 Zero, zero. But here, this will become some constant. Instead of being one, now that we are looking at an orthonormal basis, it will become some h omega. Now, what is this h omega? That is the mysterious statement that Professor Douglas had made thirty or thirty-five years ago. When you do this Gram Smith, and you are looking at gamma omega, gamma prime omega. this object h omega that comes up is essentially is essentially the curvature that's the idea okay so at this point Uh, before i go on to give examples so this this is the meaning of this statement we assign the natural meaning to ht and k omega what i mean by that is if you do this computation and come up with this 2 by 2 matrix there will be a h omega but that h omega is closely related to the uh, curvature kt okay now at this point does anybody have any any question uh, or i just go on deepak you are there yes sir yes uh you think um i mean i need to add something or say something more or it is it is uh, okay i think it's okay till now if you if i'm going towards examples it will make things more clear yeah yeah right okay so now we will uh, uh, talk about uh, explicit examples of operators in this class hopefully what i have tried to do is to explain uh, the relationship between infinite dimensional operators and somehow their eigen spaces finite dimensional eigen spaces and i have taken not just the eigen space but i have enlarged the eigen space a little bit and constructed a 2 by 2 nilpotent guy out of that and so on and so forth all of this is kind of preparation um now we we look at example the uh, like the poincare matrix which kept coming up in the previous uh, discussion of uh, the swarj lemma like the poincare matrix somehow there is a closed connection between the poincare matrix and what we call the unilateral set therefore 
the in the next few minutes what i'm going to do is to understand this relationship between the poincare metric and the unilateral shift um or rather the backward backward unilateral shift yeah there is a forward and a backward okay so let's define it the backward shift acting on the space little l to n is easily seen to satisfy all a b and c uh, which defined our class of operators uh what is the backward shift uh this was for those of you who haven't seen the backward shift uh l to n consists of uh those sequences a0 a1 an these are complex numbers such that a0 absolute square plus an absolute square plus is finite okay that is your l2 n the backward shift operator uh takes such a sequence a0 a1 an dot 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 and takes it to a1 remember it kills a0 and pulls back every single element in this sequence one step backwards that is why it is called the backward shift so in the zeroth position you get a1 in the first position you get a2 and it continues like that this is the backward shift now the beautiful thing about this backward shift is that you can write away c that what the eigen vectors are what are the eigen vectors if i look at this vector gamma omega that i have written down and i apply the backward shift to it what i will get as i told you i just now wrote down so here omega is of course in the any element in the disk because omega is in the disk one comma omega comma omega square so on this belongs to little l2 of n because i can simply add 1 plus absolute omega square plus absolute omega to the power 4 and so on and this will be 1 over 1 minus absolute omega square okay and this is obviously being a geometric series convergent all that so 1 omega omega square all of this is in l2 n now if i take that and um, and apply the backward shift on that vector gamma omega what will happen by definition as i just now told you it will become omega the first element gets pulled the the zeroth element gets killed so one is killed omega gets pulled back to the zeroth position the next one gets pulled back to the first position and we get this but that is exactly the same as omega comma 1 comma omega comma omega square and so on which is actually equal to omega times gamma omega okay so s minus of gamma omega is actually an eigen vector not only that if you look at gamma omega inner product with any other uh, uh, vector from from your uh, hilbert space you take the inner product with x suppose x is of the form every vector in l2 is of the form like this so if you take its inner product with any other vector of this form what are you going to get well this is going to be x0 plus x1 omega plus x2 omega square plus therefore the map 
omega going to this omega in the disk is polymorphic okay so this is actually one of the most uh, interesting examples if you like of a an element in the cavan douglas class let us do a little bit more to explain this k0 omega business now gamma omega is this is where i said poincare metric and the backward shift are closely related if i look at gamma omega norm square i have already said it when doing that other computation gamma omega norm square is 1 minus absolute omega square which is actually the poincare metric what is the curvature the curvature at omega of this metric is d d bar or d square d omega d omega bar of log 1 minus absolute omega square and i leave it for each of you to do this computation you will find that this becomes 1 minus absolute omega square to the power minus 2 in many places there is a negative sign added in which case you will get it to be minus this okay so in this example i have discussed here is an example in the cavan douglas class and what i have told you is what is the metric what is the curvature okay and how the metric looks like the poincare metric from before now let us come back to what we were discussing namely again back to a little bit of linear algebra so there is a natural nilpotent action n omega on the space gamma omega remember what is this gamma omega this gamma omega is nothing but uh, gamma omega comma gamma prime omega now the n omega which is uh, which as we have said is uh, t minus omega times identity and we have uh, we have seen before that this n omega is going to map gamma prime omega to gamma omega and of course n omega is going to map gamma omega to zero because that's just an eigen vector now uh now if you take gamma omega where as i told you the two vectors were gamma omega and gamma prime omega but by now i mean i'm sure you you can orthonormalize these two elements gamma omega and gamma prime omega by the gram smith orthonormalization remember that gamma omega and gamma prime omega are in Uh, in a hilbert space which means this is actually an inner product space being an inner product space you do the gram smith orthonormalization and again there is a little bit of detail here that you need to verify for yourself when you do the i mean this detail you can verify for yourself depending on your level of sophistication you you don't have to do any computation you can simply say that uh, if you take any two vectors like this and you do the gram smith if your original operator which i have already told you had to be of the form 0 1 0 0 then it will become become something of this form with respect to the orthonormal elements okay now the main point is that little thing sitting in that corner is what okay the main question is when you do this orthonormalization what is this h omega and that again is a computation if you do that computation it will turn out that h of omega is exactly gamma omega norm square gamma prime omega norm square gamma omega norm square minus gamma prime omega gamma omega inner product absolute square to the square 
This is a straightforward Gram Smith orthonormalization. Okay. So we are slowly approaching. Uh, well, actually, at this point, I must say, let me let me just add a little bit something here. If you think of the curvature, the expression for the curvature is actually equal to gamma prime omega norm square. This will come up later, but let me write now so that you sort of get to see minus gamma prime omega minus gamma omega absolute square divided by gamma omega naught. This will come out of a general general computation. This is d square d omega d omega bar log gamma omega norm square. Okay. And you notice that therefore this quantity h omega, if I look at uh, this curvature, it is nothing but one over h omega square. So this is what Professor Douglas meant when he said that the curvature is nothing but somehow just a just a gram smith. Okay, you are looking at the two dimensional space and you are doing whatever and you finally get this zero h omega zero zero and this h omega is nothing but the curvature. Okay, now let's slowly go to uh, con contractions. Um, I'll sort of, since I am again sort of running out of time, I'll try to be not uh, too detailed here. Let me, um, so first of all, if I look at, instead of looking at N omega, which was omega I uh, T minus omega I, I want to study T. I want to, in particular, understand if norm T is less or equal to one, then what does it actually mean? If I'm going to study T alone, then instead of looking at N omega, I have to look at omega I plus N omega. Now that gives me this two by two matrix. As you can understand or appreciate, if T is a contraction, if nothing else, if T is a contraction, this will imply this omega i plus n omega, which is nothing but now just T restricted to gamma omega. So this restriction of T must also be a contraction, okay? And it is a straightforward um, calculation to say this two by two matrix is a contraction if and only if h of omega is less or equal to one minus absolute omega square. Now, if you do the computation in the case of the uh, backward shift, which we have practically done, we have looked at all of this. This, for example, in the previous side, slide I have written down, this is a holomorphic map the uh, eigenvector is that, and this is a holomorphic choice. The derivative of that eigenvector is this object. And if you compute H0 omega, you will get H0 omega to be one minus absolute omega square. Therefore, the restriction of the unilateral backward shift to this gamma omega is actually nothing but omega, omega zero, one minus absolute omega square. Okay. And if you like, you can check that, uh, you know, this is exactly of norm one. Now, let us continue why uh, there is all these things that I have told you about the Gram-Smith. 
let us look at that a little bit more carefully. I have told you that somewhat informally so far. So we have this holomorphic function gamma uh, taking values in the uh, Hilbert space H, which means that it has a power series expansion. That is what I will take as its definition. These are vectors in the Hilbert space H and it has a power series expansion of this kind. Okay, zeta k, omega k. If you like, uh, you can take this to be the definition of holomorphism. This power series expansion. Okay. Then you compute gamma omega norm square, and of course, that will turn out to be this object. Okay, because the uh, inner product is linear and all that linear in one variable and linear in the other variable. So using the linearity of differentiation then, this computation, which I claimed a few pages ago, somewhere I wrote it down, maybe, no, I, I wrote it here, okay? I told you what the curvature was, but now I'm saying if you actually do the computation, you will find that uh, you are you are computing the curvature, you are doing d square d omega d omega bar log gamma omega gamma omega. You do the, just to, for you not to feel scared or anything, if you, if you just go through this computation using this formula, this is what you will get, which is what I had claimed before. But something very interesting now happens. Because you are in the uh, Hilbert space situation, what happens is, this expression on the numerator, if you look at, this is d, d omega gamma omega norm squared times gamma omega norm squared minus the inner product of these two vectors. But that should immediately remind you of uh, what is called the cosy schwarz inequality. By cosy schwarz inequality, this quantity is positive, numerator. The denominator is anyway positive, and therefore, we see that the curvature, since there is a minus sign out here, please remember there is a minus sign out here. If you take it with the minus sign, this is positive, but you put a minus sign, then you immediately observe that the curvature is negative. Well, if the curvature is negative, then you see that K0 omega minus one over H0 omega squared is, is this quantity. That's not the, uh, that's not the uh, important thing. The, the curve, if we say that, that you have this two by two matrix, which is a contraction, remember norm T lesser or equal to one implies, it's not a equivalence, but implies omega H omega zero H omega, eh, sorry, zero, omega, this norm has to be less or equal to one, but this is equivalent to H omega being less or equal to one minus absolute omega square, but this H omega is nothing but minus of the curvature to the power minus R. Now, if you put all that together, then you will find that this H omega less or equal to this quantity, well, you take the reciprocal, take the square root, multiply with a minus sign. If you do all that, you find that the curvature of any contraction is bounded above by the curvature of the backward shift. This quantity is really uh, the reciprocal of the square root of the negative of the curvature of the backward shift. Okay, so that is what occurs here on the right hand side. So the curvature inequality simply means that k of omega must be lesser or equal to k0 omega, okay? So, I mean, this, we don't need to go through this. I'm running out of time, so I'm wondering uh, if I should do this at all now. Um, I think it might be a good point to stop for now. Depending on how things are, I might uh, continue with some of these slides tomorrow or 
uh, having explained that the curvature inequality amounts to saying that k of w is lesser or equal to k zero w, uh, we might might just stop here. Uh, but I might also choose to to continue with the remaining few slides tomorrow and um, and discuss uh, a natural sort of continuation of this of establishing that the poly disc and the Euclidean ball are not biholomorphically equivalent. That's that's something I'll discuss tomorrow, but perhaps finish this tomorrow in a certain way, okay? Uh, the, the thing that remains to do is actually to connect um, what I have been calling gamma omega and uh, you know the curvature inequality to write the curvature inequality in terms of using the kernel function. And that will bring some new uh, phenomenon, which, uh, which is interesting on its own right. But my main goal today was to convey to you that when you do the orthonormalization, you end up getting, um, getting what what is what is known as the curvature that i hope i have been able to convey and uh, now now tomorrow i'll decide whether to uh, continue with this and finish the remaining course okay thank you very much let me stop here for today